Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts, of George Mason University and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, find other episodes, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. My guest today is Robin Hansen, my colleague here at George Mason University. Robin, welcome back to Econ Talk. Thanks for having me. Robin, as you may know from our earlier podcast with him, is a very interesting person. Uh, in theory, this podcast is going to be generally about signaling an economic concept where people spend resources to convey to convey information about themselves to others. But I can imagine us getting into a wide range of topics as in, is as inevitable with Robin. And I'm going to start with a leftover topic from our previous podcast on healthcare, uh, which is talking about doctors. Uh, doctors in today's world, we have a certain uh, presumption that they behave the way they do for various reasons. But what Robin's interested in pointing out is the incentives they face are a little bit different than some other decision makers in, in our lives. And we don't always notice that. It may not lead to the best outcomes. Right. Uh I mean, the obvious thing to compare doctors with is, say, auto mechanics or some uh, plumber or something like that. <laughs> it's uh, Yeah, doctors don't like that comparison probably, but that's the one I always think about. They both sure. work on complex systems Repairing, with a, a lot of unpredictability. Right. And, There's basically something goes wrong. They get a complaint. They have to figure out what's wrong. They have some tools, some specialized knowledge. They fix it maybe, and maybe they blame it on the system as opposed to what they can do. And uh, you have to judge if with a plumber or auto repair whether uh, they're trying to get you to do more than, than you want really whether you more than you need and whether they really know what they're talking about and uh, how much to pay them. And often you're willing to blame an auto mechanic or a plumber, right? You're not going to take the entire blame on yourself. You're going to say, this guy's full of it. I'm going to try somebody else. Uh, this car doesn't need to be repaired. I'm just going to drive it off the lot. Uh, but with doctors, we don't really treat them that way. No, we don't. Um, do you have any friends who are doctors? No, actually. Okay. Just keep, keep <laughs> I do. So just for the record, we keep going. Yeah. Aside from those, of course, your, your friends. Yeah. We'll set those aside as an exception. But uh, but we were actually quite unwilling to blame doctors for things that go wrong with us or around us medically. So uh, if if we go to the doctor and we get well, we say, you know, thank goodness for modern medicine. If we go to the doctor and get worse, we say, thank good I caught it early. <laughs> or it was just bad luck. Or right. yeah, uh, I, I do find it interesting as an economist. It does cross my mind that sometimes doctors have self-interest in giving me more treatment than less. Sometimes that self-interest is protective against a lawsuit sure. or, or other aspects of the legal environment. Uh, and sometimes, of course, it's what we call in economics pecuniary. Uh, they have a monetary incentive. They make more money sure. on more procedures. We're very un unlikely, though, to think that of our doctors uh, as opposed to our auto mechanics who we're very likely to think that about them. Well, why is there such a difference, you think? Because it's part of this big collection of differences about medicine. So we talked last time about how my general attitude is to collect a lot of puzzles about something and then try to find a small number of assumptions to explain them all together. So if this is one of the puzzles I say we collect about medicine. We're, As we're, opposed to trying to explain you, one puzzle yeah, at one a time, time with one yeah. unique theory yeah, that come conflicts up with, with other. Yeah. <laughs> right. So I'd say in general, we're, uh, this is clearly different about medicine. We, we don't want to be very skeptical about them. I mean, this even comes down to something as basic as the washing their hands. Honestly, doctors don't wash their hands as much as they're supposed to. You, you probably heard this was a great innovation from a century ago. You know, washing hands, good idea. We actually had a podcast <laughs> that, that dwelt on it in passing. I think uh, it came up in the David Lee. No, that, maybe it's in the David Lee and Hart, yeah. but I'm not sure. I'll have to check. But yeah, but hand washing is a good idea. Right. But uh, we're not even, you know, willing to ask our doctor when we saw him, hey, did you wash your hands? Or like they don't do it in front of us just to show us to be sure. Like a, the auto mechanic that gives you the old parts back. You don't want the old parts. He's just trying to convince you. See, I'm not trying to give you somebody else's old parts in your car, right? Which is a nice, nice gesture of uh, you know some sort of honesty. Doctors don't do that. Uh, you, you think that's uh, that's an interesting thing about the hand washing. It, it would be nice if they washed their hands in, in front, front of you. Yeah. <laughs> then you could see that they did yeah, it. Yeah. No, it crosses my mind again. I don't know. I don't think I'm typical. Uh, I do always wonder where they've been recently. Um, so yeah, with another sick person, probably, <laughs> yeah. almost yeah. surely, right? Well, but I like to think that on the way they wash their hands. Yeah, but yeah. you can see how busy they are. I, I will say though that interestingly, um, I, I don't know how this fits into the puzzle, but uh, my my friends who are doctors, I, if I'm say 
feeling under the weather, a little bit feel cold coming on or a little fluish, I'll often decline to shake hands with them when I run into them. And they always laugh and shake my hand because <laughs> they say, you know, I'm around so much stuff all day. What's the big deal? Of course, you know, maybe that's <laughs> why they're not washing between each one. <laughs> yeah, well, they, they, they just sort of easy come, easy go maybe. No, I, I don't think so. I think they do wash their hands. I assume they're absorbing stuff uh, in the air. But. Well, another even simpler puzzle is uh, in the last few years, we've actually had some websites out there which uh, give you data on individual doctors you can actually so at least uh, there's medicare records uh how if these people have treated anyone elderly you can get data on this doctor and the track record of them with their patients you can get similar data on hospitals and you can actually go look up your individual doctor and how well they've done relative to a statistical model that's trying to you know correct for the risk of the patients they've dealt with uh people aren't don't seem to be interested in looking this stuff up <laughs> We've had similar kinds of things for a long time. People try to put up, you know, data on the quality of doctors, and people don't even want to think about it. They don't even want to deal with the idea that their doctor might not be the best. I'm not sure I agree with that. I, 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 that may be generally true. The people I know are rabidly interested in, in getting, quote, the best doctor. Uh, they might be choosing between two doctors, and they'd love a recommendation as to which one's better, even though, sure. even though it is – for all the statistical modeling going on, it's going to be very difficult sure. to, to measure which one's better. We have, I would say... It's easier with hospitals. Now, now, one of your puzzles, I know one of the things you want to invoke, which you invoked the last time, is that medicine's different, that we have an emotional, cultural right. uh, set of um, beliefs about medicine that, that we're really actually burdened with that keep us from possibly doing the right thing or the best thing for ourselves despite our self-interest. So why don't you mention that theory briefly in review? Because I want to I want to okay. challenge it in this application. Well, before we get that to that though, just in this one context of your friends, they yes, people want high quality doctors, but that's not the same thing as wanting doctors with a good track record. Good point. For doing well for the patients. So in particular, we see this phenomenon of people wanting to go to the hospitals that do the latest treatments, and they wanting to get the latest treatments. And uh, as I tell my health economics students, uh, this is for the most part a bad idea. So if you just understand innovation in, what? <laughs> innovation in general is you have a, a stock of old established treatments and then you've got a pile of new treatments we're trying out and most of the new treatments are a bad idea because they're going to go away. We only keep a few of the new treatments to add to our stock right. it's of one old thing, treatments. It's one thing to be the first guy to try the Apple Newton versus the Apple iPod. The right. iPod turned out to be a good bet. The Newton failed, didn't pass the market test at least at the time. Right. So you're suggesting that the average medical new medical treatment, by definition, is going to not turn out to be accepted. Right. So it, we actually can compare large hospitals and small hospitals. And what you'll find is that, on average, uh, for any given uh, treatment, for any given kind of thing a hospital can do to you, the hospital that does it the more often, per, number per day, per week, right. is better. They'll have a lower death rate, lower mortality rate, right. better outcomes. Uh, of course, large hospitals you know, do almost... You know, for any one thing that both a large and a small hospital does, the large hospital is going to do it better. However, on average, large hospitals are not better for you than small hospitals. Paradoxical. Given right. What so you what's just what's said. going on? Well, the, the thing is, large hospitals also do things small hospitals don't do at all, mm. and those are worse. That's very interesting. So, the implication is, uh, you should go to a large hospital for for a <laughs> but make sure hernia, that whatever they do, hernia, hernia. <laughs> saying right. that, that they're kind of straightforward. They've done it a million times. Right. Not so much a large hospital. A doctor who's done many right. hernias many times in a hospital that's so, done so resist times. the new thing so you know go to the large hospital but ask them would they be doing this in a small hospital if they proudly say oh no this is a new thing that those people aren't up on it's, uh, politely decline and ask for the old thing yeah but the reason i brought up the newton in the ipod is that some people are early adopters right and they, they like the newest thing of course there's a big difference between the right. newest gadget and the newest gadget well, there's, taking there's a social kidney. status benefit of having yeah. the newest gadgets and honestly i think there's a lot of social status going on in medicine people want to have the Highest status doctor, even if it's not the healthiest doctor. So sure about that. I think they're also just worried they're missing out on something that might save their life. Don't you think it's a, a risk averse? You're saying the data doesn't support. Yeah, but they're, 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 people are overwhelmingly worried about not getting enough, and they're not worried at all enough about getting too much. Yeah, no, and that's on the margin, there's about equal amounts of both. <laughs> Apparently, we get about we we get too much as often as we get too little, because on the margin, uh, the, there's just no correlation between how much we get and our health. So give me. Give us that thumbnail sketch of the uh, cultural theory of why we waste money on medicine. 
or make irrational well, decisions well, the, in medical the, uh, areas. The thumbnail sketch is that uh, we evolved habits long ago, uh, our distant ancestors, to uh, try to signal to our uh, associates that we care about them and that we're a good, strong allies. And we had a limited number of signals available to us. And when somebody was sick, was an especially potent time to signal to them that we cared about them and to show them we weren't going to dump them because that was a good time to dump them. If we were going to dump them. And so... Uh, Caring for somebody when they were in a vulnerable position like that evolved as a signal of allegiance. And uh, we now tend to still treat medicine as a signal of allegiance. We uh, interpret people making sure that they have health plans for us and coming to visit us at the hospital, et cetera, as a showing that they care. Now, this is a ludicrous theory, but um, uh, Robin defended it quite <laughs> admirably in his earlier podcast, and I found it quite provocative. So if that strikes you as absurd, um, I encourage you to go back and listen to that first podcast. But let me ask you about the application of this to, to doctors and the expenditure of um, resources on treatments that don't seem to be effective. Uh, we, we got into this just now by talking about people don't seem to be interested in statistical analyses of who the good doctors are, who the good hospitals. But they also don't seem to be so interested in the auto mechanics and the plumbers. Now, there are such systems out there. Uh, I've been surprised at how slowly such systems have evolved and how little people use them. What most people rely on is either word of mouth, which is important, mm -hmm. obviously, a recommendation from someone they trust, or um, the, this is worse, um, their casual first impression when the person walks in their door to give them an estimate to repair their house oversee their construction, um, fix their car. You know, you just get a certain good feel about some people. And some of us do that well. Others probably do it very poorly. And some people are good at fooling people that they're honest and will only recommend things that are, quote, necessary. Um, so, but having said all that, I, I don't, these services are not thriving that evaluate, I don't think, that right. evaluate quality of fixers, people who intervene in complex systems. So, how do you explain that? So there's two things going on here. One of which medicine is weird compared to other things. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is everything is weird compared to our sort of simplest theories of what people should be doing. And uh, I'm trying to come to terms with both of those. Uh, so this general concept of signaling is something that's trying to adjust the sort of wide range of weirdness that we see everywhere. And uh, you know, more particular theories about medicine are trying to address the additional special weirdness of medicine. So I think that uh, while we aren't very skeptical about auto mechanics or plumbers or home contractors, we are moderately skeptical of them. We, we aren't as interested in quality data as we probably should be, and it's somewhat of a puzzle there, but we're at least paying some attention there. And in medicine, we're just paying vastly less attention. Yeah, my, my claim would be that, uh, that there's a lot of noise in the data it's hard to perceive who's a quality repair person and who's a quality mechanic. And so a, a third-party statistical analysis of quality would be very difficult to evaluate. And so rules of thumb work better. I'm not sure that isn't why we don't – I'm getting into too many double negatives. I think that's why people also don't care too much about their doctor's statistical quality because I think they are – not so trusting of that, and I think correctly so. Do you think there's grounds for, for being more uh, relying on such data? So again, um, we want to sort of collect a lot of phenomena and uh, compare it all together. If, if we didn't have any other theory to go on, we'd have to throw our hands up and I say, I guess it's just harder to evaluate quality than it seems, and I guess that's just what they're stuck with. Um, but I think when you look at a lot of things together, you say, that just doesn't quite cut it. Um, you just consider real estate agents, I mean, we have this long-standing puzzle, you know, they get 6% between the two of them, which is a huge amount of money. Uh, and even the person who's uh, your, your buyer's agent, you gets paid more, the more you pay for your house. And you got to figure, well, that can't be right. At least just pay them a fixed fee or something, <laughs> rather than paying them more if they pay a higher price. It's called an incentive. I don't, that doesn't yeah. bother. I don't find that so puzzling. So, but so why do you mention that? What's the relevance of that? Well, it's just for the uh, medical. It's discussion? just more obviously something that's wrong in terms of your relationship with one of these experts. Yeah. Of but I think that's just an example of people who don't really think carefully enough about the real estate market and what really goes on and how hard it is to to convince someone to buy your house and how hard it is to negotiate with someone who hates your guts and might hate your guts or gets per gets personal. It's a lot of value. Right. You know, that's giving a benefit of the doubt, saying, yeah, I guess it's just kind of hard. But, but think, I want to think about some other explanations, okay. sort of bring some other things to the table. Um, because um, 
you know, if we, if we look overall at human behavior and, and try to you know, take a bird's eye view of all the things we see people do and what, what we understand about what they do, um, there's a number of sort of awkward big chunks there. Uh, especially if we take, say, an evolutionary psychology sort of perspective. You know, you look at a tiger, you watch the tiger as it goes through its day, you look at sort of how it does each thing it does. It makes sense mostly in terms of the kinds of things the tiger's trying to do and the kind right. of uh, abilities and we goals that it has. We don't attribute any strange motives. We don't have to attribute <laughs> right. any strange motives to the tiger. And that's true for most animals and, you know, behavior. Sometimes there's animal behavior we don't quite understand, but for the most part, animals are pretty well understood in terms of the kinds of things they're trying to do and the information they have available. Then we look at people from a bird's eye view and people who evolved from the same competitive evolutionary context which is supposedly some pinnacle of, of well honed you know advantage and then you see them doing all these pretty strange things you see oh. them yeah go ahead you know they have they, they have random conversations about abstract things that seem to have nothing to do with their lives they build pretty curtains uh, they you know they have wild parties they they Go on long hikes. I mean, they just do, yeah. they do this do this huge range of things that people do that doesn't seem to make that much sense in terms of sort of you know just the basics of you know eating, keeping it cold out, uh, having reproducing, you know, expanding. The, that just doesn't get you very far. It right. seems. Right. Oh, definitely. So so, but that's usually most people <laughs> conclude that the evolutionary psychology perspective has a very limit has limited application to human beings but that's not your conclusion no no i'd say uh it well it's obvious that we have to understand people in terms of their evolutionary origin if and if our simple cut at it doesn't work we have to kind of better cut so the question is what do we have in the tool bag here to make a better cut and i think um one of the best better cuts we have is something like what i'm calling signaling well, let's. I, I want to open up to that wider discussion, but w explain first what that has to do with. Um, you're, so you're suggesting, because the leap is not so obvious, I suspect, uh, you're suggesting that our lack of zeal in evaluating our doctors is a burden we carry with us from our evolutionary past that we liked it when we and others spent unnecessary resources on healthcare to signal love and affection. Is that the, is that the conclusion? Well, that's part of it. So it's, it's going to be a bigger story. So it's going to have to be a story also about how we're not very, you know, what, what sort of relationship we have with our real estate agent and our plumber and other people in our lives and what sort of ancestral relationship that's like that we're modeling. So what is it like? Um, well, first, the thing to understand, as we talked about in our last podcast, is that our ancestors' world was largely <clears throat> other people in the same tribe. That is, they had large enough tribes that outside predators weren't the main problem. Uh, the weather wasn't the main problem. They, they could protect each other well enough in the tribe, but they had to protect themselves from the rest of the tribe. Uh, the main environment that they had to deal with was uh, shifting coalitions and alliances within a tribe and the extended tribe outside. So. It was extremely important to our ancestors to um, present themselves as a desirable and impressive someone you wouldn't want to cross, somebody you want on your side, and also to, uh, to infer about other people around them, not only who would make a desirable ally, who was intending to remain a desirable ally, and um, these two key parameters I'll call ability and loyalty. We were trying to seem able and loyal and trying to uh, discern ability and loyalty in the people around us, and this dominated our world. And so lots of things we did serve that function. Uh, they may have served another function, but if they could serve that function, they were recruited to serve that function. So of course, uh, in a, you know, if you were sick, you did need some help and you got some help and that was a direct benefit you got. But if the, seeing who helped you was an important sign of things you needed to know about, then you paid attention to that sign and waited heavily. And then other people anticipating that you would interpret an action that way adjusted their behavior to uh, try to make the best presentation they could. So the basic signaling idea is that a lot of human behavior has evolved for, to serve the purpose of presenting ourselves in the most favorable light. Okay, but then why, what does that have to do with why I trust my doctor, why I foolishly trust my doctor without any more evidence? And wouldn't it also suggest that evolution and selection would have chosen us for being really good at evaluating who's honest and who's lying and who's dishonest and who's dissembling and who's sneaky. Well, and, and we are remarkably good, good at, at that. It, yeah. um, so first of all, this general story explains why we do too much of various things. 
So uh, the sig standard signaling story says that uh, the amount you do of something that is, has some use is not just the amount that would be useful, but it's the amount that would have to distinguish yourself from somebody who didn't have the same ability, loyalty, or whatever it is as you. So you can have a vast out of proportion, say, between the amount of help you get and the amount of help you need if somebody's doing it just to show that they care. So how, you know, how often do people really need to come to the hospital when you're sick? You don't really need them to come very much or very many of them, but still they do. Why? To show you that they were willing to come and that they're the sort of person who uh, wouldn't not come. Uh, so that's one parameter, which is just how much. So signaling explains an, an over activity of things that you would otherwise not have. Have you ever been in the of. hospital, Robin? Yeah. Uh, did you felt that people came too much? Was that, was well, that... there's a question of, you know, for your, for your basic medical needs, but you feel a comfort by them coming. Right. Well, right, well that's the whole point of the signaling story. So you, they're showing something and you're receiving the signal on the other end and the signal comforts you because uh, you are concerned exactly in that situation to uh, be comforted. Right. Um, so another dimension that the theory addresses is uh, con what kind of signals are relevant of quality? So uh, we may have discussed this last time. Um, on Valentine's Day, when you're buying your significant other a box of chocolates, you don't ask yourself primarily how hungry are they. The size of the box of chocolates isn't you know, directly related to the size of the hunger. The size of the box of chocolates, the expense is related, well, how much do I care? If I bought a smaller one, would that make me see like I'm less caring? And you buy as big as one as you need to show how much you care. As additionally, there's the question of um, the quality of the brand of chocolate or the type of chocolate. So you could imagine getting a private signal about quality that they wouldn't see, and the question is how much that would that influence the choice of your, the choice of the brand or the type you gave? So you're saying if uh, the argument here has to be that, let's say, um, the best chocolate is actually the cheapest chocolate's the best one to, so to you taste. You have to know that, yeah, right. But you wouldn't ever give the best chocolate. You're Not suggesting. if you didn't think they if, knew that, right? If they didn't, you might, right? Well, if, I mean, if they didn't. It's complicated, actually. You need some sort of like common knowledge. You, you need some sort of common understanding of what was the best. And you'd be tempted to go with this common understanding of what was the best, even if you had private signals to the contrary. Similarly, on their end, if you give them a box of chocolates and they say, this isn't my favorite brand to their own mind, but they say to themselves, how could they have known? Uh, then they're going to give you credit for generosity uh, as if uh, they did like it or they did think it was the best because they didn't think you could have known. So in signals... Uh, in gifts which are intended to convey signals of concern, it's common signals of quality that matter, and not so much private signals of quality. And so to, this is to say we've evolved a tendency to pay primarily, to pay attention mainly to common signals of quality for activities and products that are mainly intended to signal things to other people. But in your world, there are many things that do such... Right, not just, not just not just boxes of chocolate. Not just Valentine's not, Day. Right, not, this isn't a one day a year phenomenon. Right, so so most of us are conscious at some parts times in our lives of doing something for their appearance sake. Right, we're conscious that on a job interview we're trying to look and show our best, or a date, or maybe on Valentine's Day, maybe with the family at Christmas. We're on our best behavior, we're presenting ourselves as best we can, and in that context, it's obvious that the signaling story makes sense. Right, we're trying to look good. We might wear a nicer suit to the job sure. interview than we normally wear show up in a better car if it's the real estate right. agent looking for the, their, the first appointment, et cetera. Okay, so, okay. But, but we tend to segregate this in our mind as sort of a minor part of our lives. Right, it's just a weird thing that we have to go through. Once it's, in a it's while. A, it's a duty that occasionally, and of course people differ in how their willingness to cater to that. There are people, right. many of them are colleagues, which we won't mention any names, Robin, quiet. Was, who, <laughs> yeah, be quiet. Who will dress in a different way because they just don't either, either, they don't care about the standard signal, or they enjoy conveying a different signal. It's also a possibility. There's a right? theory of counter signaling that yeah. actually addresses that. Well, yeah. we may not want to get into that quite yet. <laughs> All right. So you skip the funeral because you're beneath, you're you're above that kind of tawdry uh, well, cultural. Well, during the dot com revolution, an executive might wear jeans to show them that I'm not just any old executive. I'm a dot com executive. Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's a tasteful example. Okay, go ahead. So you're so it's a wider phenomenon. It's it's much wider in your view. And go ahead. that is uh, a lot of the times when we feel sincere. Well, of course, in a sense, we are sincere. How could we feel sincere and not be sincere? But the actions we take are driven by this huge, complicated subconscious machinery that was designed by evolution to achieve certain outcomes. Many of which are to make us look good. So, uh, for example, we honestly like, my, my kids honestly loved the board games that they won. 
That what? That they win. Uh, that they're good at. If you, if you give them a board game and they lose, they don't like that game. Right. If they win, they like that game. Yes. It's an honest and sincere feeling. Correct. <laughs> and over the years, it accumulates into activities they sincerely and honestly like. My older son loves basketball, and he's good at basketball. Uh, that's a very sincere feeling, but I think, you know, underneath there's this obvious machinery that makes us focus on the activities we look good at. Okay. So in that case, you're saying there's no, let's, I want to make sure we understand the, that I understand the, uh, the gap here between reality and perception. You're saying that I could really love, um, to play bridge. It just, I get really ple- a lot of pleasure from the, the game itself. Right. But I'm horrible at it. Right. I lose most of the time. I get scorned by my partner who, who resents being paired with me. But I'm enjoying it. Right. The, the, the mechanics of the game I find sure. stimulating and interesting. But the fact that I'm horrible at it, which, which I am, footnote, <laughs> um, and I want to apologize to my high school bridge players, uh, teammates who I got drafted into onto the team a couple times when there was a missing person and they pretended that they didn't that it was fine that I'd be the substitute and I said I didn't want to I'm really not very good at it and they said no no it's okay I won't resent it when you play horribly they couldn't keep that promise they resented <laughs> it I don't blame them I shouldn't have said yes but anyway uh, so you're saying that if I'm bad at bridge even if I quote enjoy it uh, I will submerge that enjoyment and decide I don't like bridge whereas something that I really don't find that interesting like playing basketball, I might continue to play if I'm really good at it. Right. Well, not so much that you'll submerge it, but just things inside you will find other attentions for you, that you will just, as a process of being you, find that you don't find it as interesting anymore. You're not as sincerely interested in it. Uh, Is that a bad thing? No, it's not a bad thing, but it just shows you how much of your sincere activities are often driven by these s- signaling right. it's kind uh, of harmless. mechanisms. It's kind of harmless that I don't play bridge, and I'm, I really <laughs> love doing the Sunday crossword puzzle, actually, uh, at right. your times. And you're probably uh, not too bad at it. I'm pretty good at it, turns out. I like to think I am. Maybe I'm not. But since I feel like I'm good at it, I, pr- I feel pleasure from it, and right. I keep doing it on Sunday. And there's all these things we do with our free time that we feel like we do just because they're fun, just because they're enjoyable. We don't feel like we're doing them to show off. But then when we do finish the crossword puzzle, we don't mind saying, hey, look what I did. Yeah. It's only been 15 minutes yeah, or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but that feels like just a perfectly reasonable thing than sharing your joy with somebody so, else. Yeah. So give me. So you're suggesting that a lot of this let, – let's try to give a test of this. So the test would be if um, – and so I take the New York Times, which I don't – I just want for the record, I don't do this very often. Let's pretend I've done it once or twice, which I think is accurate, but I could be just saying that for appearance's sake. But I am admitting that I've done it once or twice. I take the Sunday New York Times crossword puzzle to the Little League game of, of my son to fill the time while I'm – When he's not up and batting. When he's not batting, of course. I, I, I don't miss uh, – and actually, unfortunately, it turns out or fortunately – I find it, I'm unable to read or do the crossword puzzle. I usually find myself enjoying the whole game, which puts me in a very small group. Uh, I don't just watch when, when my kids are up. Um, but you're suggesting that if other people couldn't admire my prowess – I do it in pen, by the way. Yeah. Right? So, so I, you're suggesting that there's some pitiful bit of, <laughs> bit of showing off going on that I take the New York Times crossword puzzle, do it in pen, and that if people weren't going to be there – if just I was the yeah. only fan, I'd be less likely to take less the crossword puzzle. That's the claim. Less likely to do it as quickly, perhaps. Uh, but I could be sort of stuck thinking I'm right. enjoying it. You're also suggesting. We, we also do a lot of things alone, of course. Right. And then when we're alone, we think, well, th- we can't possibly be doing this. This is the real thing. This is the real thing. But, of course, you know, we do talk about these things to other people later. We do. And people but we do, can lie b- about those. People break in on us sometimes, unanticipated. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there's this whole thing about uh, anonymous gifts and charity. Mm-hmm. So, so one actual, obviously, part about signaling is the charity and the warm glow story. And so we economists tend to be a little more cynical in this way of thinking that people are often giving to charity for reasons other than pure altruism. I'm not so much in that group, right. but, I, but I understand the argument. Like, right. we, we should make, by warm glow, you mean the... It's the good feeling you get. Or the good feeling that others get about you, right? right? Seeing that you're right. a giver. You can distinguish those, right? As but, opposed to just caring about the outcomes that your money produces. That right. would be the narrower definition of right. altruism. So, so it's uh, you know often people, uh, in order to uh, convince themselves and others that they're really honest, that, that they're just being altruistic, they try to give in secret. Yes, some people do. Uh, and I understand from charity uh, organizations that I've worked with uh, that, in fact, the people who give in secret aren't very vigilant about making sure it's actually kept secret. They don't actually mind that much if it gets out that they gave the money in secret. That's an interesting question. Um, 
Yeah, my, my dad in the past is when anonymous gifts have been announced that uh, like the banquet for a charity will we'll stand up and take bows or, or make <laughs> knowing glances to people, at least at his table. Right. It's clearly a form of humor, uh, but uh, why are there any anonymous gifts? Is it just is the point just that they're rare, or is that that's an, actually another? You could even say that's right. another form of signaling, right? Or well, you think of the case where somebody, you know, you do something nice for a friend, somebody on the street, homeless person on the street or something, walking down the street and nobody knows you. Imagine somebody across the street who you didn't anticipate there noticed you and saw you do this. They might think you, they might give you extra credit for your generosity, thinking that you didn't anticipate anybody seeing you. Yeah, it's possible. So, um, so it's really, you know, it's hard to escape these things. But, but honestly, you know, we're not just talking about charity and we're talking about basically almost everything we do, even as academics, even as researchers. Uh, you know, when there's a variety don't of... Re- say even. <laughs> even. Please don't. <laughs> even when we're ideologues and even when we're politically sincere, uh, you know, there's a lot of our behavior that's driven by these uh, underlying motives, perhaps too strong, but uh, tendencies. And I think this gives you a lot of insight into human behavior uh, if you think about uh, these underlying tendencies. Um, you, this is often called a cynical point of view. It appears to be on the surface. Um, and, and in a sense... Because it, it suggests that everybody is, no matter what people do, that appears to be selfless or kind, it all has an ulterior motive, is sort of, would be the worry. Right. Well, of course, I mean, in some sense, we, we just couldn't be the more com- most complicated creatures we are without there being lots of ulterior things below the surface. But in a sense, they could be ulterior, better motives than we appear to have, in a sense. So cynicism usually means an, uh, attributing low motives to people's behavior. So ulterior... Uh, is only cynical if ulterior is low. Uh, if ulterior were high... So, so what are some of those high motives that, that might motivate people that would be more attractive? Because usually the story would be, oh, everybody's trying to get ahead. They're trying to get an edge. So they pretend to be nice. They're really going to stick a knife in your back when they have a chance. The, the salesperson yeah. pretends to be your friend but actually sells you a piece of junk that isn't right for you. That would be the worry about... That would be a cynical view that, that about a salesperson that usually is a, is a good thing to have. But on the other hand, when someone comes and visits you in the hospital, usually you don't want to say to them, look, buddy, I know you don't want to be here. You're just trying to signal, signal to me that you're my friend. You're stuck with this evolutionary baggage, and don't worry. Uh, I still think you're my friend. If you don't come, you should have stayed home and done something else. This does sound a little bit cynical. It is cynical. So the interesting thing about cynical – so cynical is low, attributing low motives to behavior. Uh, and so there's this range of motives that we have uh, apparently agree on the hierarchy of uh, altruism, generosity, uh, uh, grand uh, nobility, you know, um, going for great achievement in art or science or something like that. That would be a high motive, uh, you know, advancing the contrib- human knowledge. Contribute to the world, pushing out the frontiers of knowledge. World yeah, peace, et cetera, like that. What was that? World peace. World peace, that's right. good. Those, those are high motives, and low motives are, you know, our own base gold, desire gold. to eat, have sex, gold, you know. money. People, get people to like us, yeah. yeah. Things like that, right. And what I find interesting is that this spectrum of uh, motives we uh, project on people is it's ancient. There's this ancient distinction between projecting high and low motives. And honestly, the projecting of low motives is, in a sense, the usual wisdom of the old and not entirely, you know, and jaded, basically. Uh, so the cynical view is, in a sense, the standard established view in you know most older people who have a fair bit of experience, right? But this cynical view is not supposed to be voiced very prominently right. in you know public discussions of what we're doing or what you're doing or things like that. There's a, there's a disapproval of discussing cynical theories, and in part it makes sense because uh, you have to ask what's the motive of the cynic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you could have a idealist cynic who is simply has high motives themselves and is offended by the great world around them and the hypocrisy they see in people uh, pretending they have high motives and they really have low motives. That would be the idealist cynic. The cynical cynic is somebody who sees in his, the low motives in others all too clearly because he has them all too clearly in himself. Right. And uses his <laughs> His perception of others to make sure right. that he doesn't get taken advantage of and, and takes advantage of others when he and, can. And, to, and is, for example, a loser. You know, if you say, you know, sure that, uh, you know, musician is, is a great musician, is a successful musician or a politician, but they probably got there by, you know, stepping on people well, behind the scenes and trying to, you know, pull down other people's success uh, because they're losing themselves. So that's also a usual accusation of the cynic. He's, he's just a sore loser. Well, two things come to mind there. Um, 
don't know if you've seen No Direction Home, the Martin Scorsese documentary of Bob Dylan. It's a very interesting portrait. It's My understanding is it's fairly sanitized that Scorsese had very limited access to the people and to Dylan and to the people in Dylan's life. And if, if you look at the clips, you don't ever see it, an interviewer asking the questions. You hear a question and, and you see the response of the person being interviewed. But one thing you get from that portrait, sanitized as it is, is a, a little bit of disillusionment about Dylan as an artiste. Uh, Dylan, in many people's minds, is this uh, noble protester, this great folk singer who took this Native American art form and lifted it up to a new level. <coughs> in the Scorsese documentary, it doesn't really come across that way. It comes across as an opportunistic careerist who saw an opportunity to imitate Woody Guthrie, really didn't care much about the political scene, in fact, was extremely uncomfortable with it, and really just wanted to make a lot of money and be successful and be famous. Um, I may be being a little bit right. uh, uh, stere- uh, sharp there in, in drawing the distinction, but I think what, what I like about what you're what, – what I'm intrigued about with, with what you're saying is – that doesn't bother me at all about Bob Dylan, but it does bother a lot of people. They, they, right. they want to have the illusion that he has these, quote, higher motives. To me, they're not particularly higher motives. Uh, right. Or somebody maybe on the other side of a political spectrum who actually agrees with you privately, yeah, that's what Dylan would be like, what else did you expect, would still object to your publicly describing him that way because they figured, wow, the only reason you're picking on Dylan is because he's on the other side of the spectrum and you're being selective and that's right. the part of the game, the battle we're playing is trying to knock down the other guy's heroes, but we all sort of know no, nobody's really a hero anyway. Yeah. Uh, and so there's this quick jump to accuse the cynic of cynical motives right. for their cynicism. And in some sense, uh, I'm struck by how most all sort of, you know, textbooks, uh, public documents, things like that, tend to take an idealistic stance toward uh, the world and motives. You know, most biopics present an idealistic picture of the uh, artist. Most, you know, biographies of politician tends to try to present a relatively idealistic picture of their motives and uh Right. So, well, and this is just generically true about me. Right. Know, and we're very susceptible. What I what I find fascinating, and I'm and I don't know whether I'm agreeing with you or not, but what I do find fascinating is how susceptible we are actually to those claims when they're merely claims. The political rhetoric being the most obvious example. Political rhetoric about how much the politician cares about us, about a particular subgroup, about a particular disadvantaged group. You know, I look at that and it, it just that's just so much noise to me because I think they're just. Politicians are just trying to get elected. They'll say whatever they think people want to hear. Puzzles. Why do people want to hear that? I mean, don't they realize it's they, you know when the when the, they don't want to think when the plumber themselves. well when the plumber shows up and says, or better yet, the waterproofer, which has happened to me. You know, we got a little water in the basement, and I'm looking for a solution. And to the waterproofer who's got a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So every you know every person that the waterproofer comes to needs the thirty thousand dollar trench system with right. the fancy pumps, etc. And that's the starting point, and I kind of laugh at them. You know, they want to give me the hour right. presentation. I just say, I'm sorry. You know, I, I understand that you're really not my friend, and I don't really trust what you're saying. And again, they're probably—I right. assume they're honest waterproofers, but a lot of them, I'm going to treat with a jaded eye. I'm surprised, and most people do, uh, I assume. And I find it strange that most people don't treat their politicians like they're waterproofers. Why don't they? People often want to separate the world into you know two groups. There's those selfish, mean people out there, you know, often if you have propaganda against the enemy, you you talk about how the enemy is determined and, you know, going to fight us and they, you know, they have no internal divisions and they're, so we have to unite against them and how they're, you know, have these selfish motives, even that, you know, their leader is just manipulating their people and that's why we have to fight them. Uh, their people are all right sort of thing. Uh, we, we like to separate the world into good people and bad people <laughs> and bad people are car salesmen and politicians or whoever else are all these people people who are being manipulative and, and self-centered and not, not altruists. And then there's good people that we know. My politician. <laughs> My side. My plumber. People like me, because yeah. we want to think we're good. And part of the reason we think we're good is we are not conscious of any, we're not very conscious of these sorts of motive, high, low motives. And we say, I looked inside myself and I see high motives about what I'm doing. So I'm going to attribute, assume there are some other people out there like me, because I want to believe this about me, and so I've got to believe it about some other people. So then the question is, how do I distinguish good people from bad people? How do I see people like me from other people? And part of the problem is you don't see yourself very clearly. You see, you just look inside yourself and you think you see your motives, but you don't actually systematically look at your actions and try to correlate them with what motives could explain them. Now, that's one of the most extraordinary things that... that uh 
no matter how evil a person is in, in our eyes, they see themselves often as basically good. Uh, you know, they may have murdered someone, but you know, they were provoked. There was, and that sounds absurd. But there, there's a lot of literature on sure. high self-esteem among criminals, which is, on the surface, surprising. Uh, you'd think they'd have a little bit of questioning about their value as a human being after they'd murdered someone or done something horrifying, but they managed to sustain that misperception about themselves, what I think is a misperception, uh, for quite a while. But I, I think the unfortunate truth, I mean, unfortunate relative to our ideals, is that we're all pretty self-centered in terms of our actions, not if not in terms of our conscious motivations. Uh, if you actually look at what we do, uh, you know, if we might decide who to talk to just based on, well, I'm interested in this person. I like this person. I'm not talking to this person because they're popular or because they've got power that I could, I could take advantage of or something like that. We don't think of ourselves. Most of us don't think of ourselves very consciously choosing, you know, who to associate with and who to talk to based on the, but if you just look at the correlation of who we do choose to talk to, you know, it's kind of hard to escape the theory that people are selectively choosing who to associate with based on who can be more useful to them. Well, I like the implication that you're here because you think being on Econ Talks <laughs> is going to help you get ahead in some fashion, Robin. I don't mean well, yeah. to disillusion you. You've probably pulled that perception <laughs> from some evolutionary past that's burdening you uh, really falsely and uh, you might want right. to escape from, uh, from under it. Um, the part I also want to mention uh, that your remarks provoke um, is parenting. And I think a lot about how cynical I want my kids to be. And you want your kids to be, and again, I'm, I know I'm just, I have this false view of myself as, as a parent, Robin, based on what you've been telling me, but I actually like to think that my job as a parent, it, it's, not, it's not to make my kids as successful as possible in ways that will make them feel obligated to me. I actually think my job as a parent, perhaps I'm being fooled, is to uh, help them become fully, fully realized human beings and, and achieve their, the potential that, that they see in themselves. So when I look at them with respect to cynicism, I want them to be a little bit cynical because I don't want them to be prey for uh, cruel and cynical people. Right? And everybody agrees with that. Everyone understands yeah. that when your child's on the playground and a stranger comes up and says, want some candy, we want our child to not interact with the stranger. On the other hand, we don't want our children to be afraid of all strangers and be and, and treat everyone with enormous suspicion a, as a potential threat. So there's an interesting balance that, that we strive for. Any thoughts on that? Uh, lots of thoughts on that. I mean, so one obvious puzzle is the fact that we like to teach our children to be idealistic and more idealistic than we are. We, we like to privately be more cynical in our own thoughts than we want to teach our children to be. Lots of non-religious parents love to send their kids to church Sunday. <laughs> They like their local schools to teach an idealistic ver version of civics, even if they don't believe that idealistic version of civics. Uh, so there's lots of interesting ways in which we uh, try to push our children to uh, present them an idealized world and, you know, to teach them, you know, find the, find the topic you love and pursue that and things and, like and that. And look for the good in everyone. Don't judge right. people until you've heard the whole story. We do teach. Right. I teach my children that. Yeah. So, But, but these, of course, are somewhat at odds with our own private perceptions. Yes. Often. Uh, and then there's this more basic issue of... And, and by the way, when they get older and we feel that they are perhaps capable of now becoming as wise as we are, strangely enough, they're not as interested in our insights. It's kind of an... It's a bad strategy, right? You're suggesting that, you know, we... Let me give it... Let me put a positive spin on what you're saying. We want our children to be innocent. We want them to have this sort of naive... We don't want to be hurt, but we want them to maintain this naive innocence about the world around them until they get old enough where they're... Otherwise, they'll become jaded and cruel and, and, and harmed by, by this cynicism. So we keep them sort of innocent, naive, and knowing that when they get older, they'll, they'll find out for themselves. When we try to pass that knowledge on to them, of course, they're not interested in our opinion because they don't think we know anything. But right. We present this idealistic world, and then our idealistic son decides to become an artist, and we say, wait, 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 too far. <laughs> <laughs> That's another problem. Yeah, interesting. Uh, but, but there's this other more basic issue of paternalism, which I'm fascinated by, which, of course, is essential paternalism in government and paternalism in the parent-child relationship, that we we disagree with our children often, and we feel very sincerely that we're, we just have their best interest at, hearts, at, at heart, and so that they should, uh, you know, do what we say, and if they don't see the wisdom of our words, we should make them do what we... Which we do, for a long time. Which we do. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we're very sincere, and we often think that our sincerity should be enough to convince us to uh, that we're right and they're wrong. Uh, but, of course, we have that same dynamic in larger political realms of people on one side, you know, enforcing paternalistic policies on other and feeling that they are quite sincerely better informed. And, uh, 
you know, this is another area which I think signaling is important in, where we don't realize the other motives that are going on behind our behavior. So what's going on? Let's talk about the parenting. Um, I uh, I tell my kid not to run out in the street into traffic. Right. That's probably a good thing for the kid. So what's an example of something where – are you talking about something where uh, – they're great. They would well. My ten-year-old would love to play the drums, yeah. but I've decided that's not his best skill. I, you know, I just think it's somewhere else. I'm pretty sure it's not the drums. That right. would be a, a really obvious example. Is there something else? Other kind of examples you're thinking? Well, it about? actually infuses everything. So, so I've done this theoretical work on paternalism, and the issue is when one person gives another person advice, they could mostly share their interests, but a small difference in interest will still create a wedge in the advice. And there'll be this concern about whether you're trying to, you know, adjust for the the difference. So you may share most of your interest with your child about uh, musical taste, but there's still be a bit of a wedge. For example, if he plays the drums loud, then you won't get as much sleep. Uh, Maybe, you know, your friends won't be as impressed if they play the drums and the violin. (laughs) All right. There's lots of ways in which you and they can see that your interests diverge a little. Mm -hmm. And even moderate divergence of interest can create a wedge in your ability to communicate with them because... uh, you would give them some advice that they would anticipate is slanted because that you'll you know that you'll suspect that they won't listen entirely to you and you've got this tug of this you know war of exaggeration where you exaggerate more because they won't they're going to discount your advice and they discount your advice more because uh, they fear you're exaggerating and that can in the end lead to a big loss of communication and what it comes down to is these basic differences and the question is, do you, and often you deny, you know, even those very basic differences. No, I just, you know, I'm, I'm just looking for what would make you happy, really. I'm, I, I understand that I could have these biases, but I've tried to correct for them, and I don't think they're an issue here. So the worry here is that, is that again, I'm trying to think of some examples here where my, um, where my advice would be uh, self-interested and, and not in the interest of my, of my child. So uh, my daughter wants to be a bond trader. She wants to be an artist, and I want her to be a bond trader because why? Because I don't want to have to take care of her if she can't succeed as an artist or do I want my friends to be impressed that she's got a big house because they might be impressed that she's a great artist. Why sure. wouldn't, how, but, do you, uh, how, but, how can you distinguish again, any of those? I would suggest to take this as an example and step all the way back and look at the broad sweep of human behavior in this kind of phenomenon. So you know, one thing that's really important to people in human behavior is jockeying for status, right? We, and the question is, what marks status? What are the indicators of status that we use? And one key indicator of status that's consistent across a wide range of social contexts is control, dominance. So social dominance is often about who can make other people do things their way. So we certainly see that in the office. We see that, you know, in other sorts of relationships. Office, Robin, but go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, Herding cats is a difficult activity to show dominance in, but... We'll just leave it alone. Go ahead. Okay. But, but, you <laughs> the know, office generally. But, you know, even with a, with an associate, we often, you know, if if we make a suggestion, even about which restaurant to go to, you often see you're going out for lunch and the people who are most socially dominant will dominate the choice of where we go. Why? In part, it's a way of showing their dominance and, assert, you know, reasserting and re-verifying that they are socially dominant. But here's the problem I have with this. I'm going to stop you here because I want to prove my dominance, yeah. actually. Um, I... In, in that worldview, uh, it would suggest that the best way to show your dominance is to take people to a lousy restaurant. And to me, a lot of these signaling theories are about competition. You know, if there's not much competition, these kind of theories can – these kind of actions can play an important role. But the more competition there is, the harder it is to for me to be convinced that they're important. So for example – if if you have a friend and you're stuck in some sort of uh, neurotic, um, dysfunctional friendship where this person likes to shove you around and really doesn't care about you and forces you to eat at these horrible restaurants, the, the worse the restaurant, the better because the gap between what you want and what you're being forced to do is larger and the dominance is even greater, right? But you just stop hanging out with that guy after a while. And so – if you have alternative friends. And and so I don't understand why competition among people doesn't eliminate some of these some of these forces. Well, of course, uh, a standard thing about social status signals is uh, if you try to uh, take on the signals uh, beyond your status, it doesn't work in equilibrium. You'll you'll be shot down, right? So if you if if you are in fact the biggest guy on the block, you can kick people around a bit and they'll have to take it. If you aren't the biggest guy, then you'll uh, find yeah, out that that doesn't true. work so well. That's well said. Uh, so, um, in fact, you know, people do have to adjust their dominant signals to the 
level of dominance that they're signaling and the level of dominance they can get away with. Well, let's take the example, which is the classic example of signaling from the economics literature. You've been applying it in this conversation to lots of things. Uh, my head's spinning a little bit. I'm sure some of you out there are having a similar phenomenon. Uh, but what I want to do is that we'll talk about this one example, and then I'm gonna, we're going to come back and we'll try to pull some things together uh, and try to try to uh, clarify some of the things we've been talking about. Standard example of signaling in the economics literature is education. So there's a claim uh, that's econo- that education doesn't help you become more effective at your job. It merely is a way of informing uh, employers about your pre-existing quality as a w- potential worker. So h- how does that theory work? What's the claim? And do you, do you agree with it? Well, so first of all, it's going to be a mixture of uh, functions. So um, almost any activity that has signaling component also typically has other components. So education uh, does many things. It's one of these complicated social institutions like marriage or other, you know, friendship even that serves many different functions at once. So education at the moment serves a function of, you know, teaching us specific skills uh, it serves the function of uh, developing social habits of obedience and discipline, things like that. It uh, creates social bonds between people. People uh, create, you know, selective assortive that sets them up for potential mates and friends and things like that. And in addition, it's claimed, which I find quite plausible, that uh, education shows some things about your qualities that uh, other people then use to infer uh, qualities that you have in addition to uh, qualities that were created through this process. So if some of us are just more conscientious, hardworking, smart, uh, then uh, that will show up in uh, our performance in school. And people who are interested in those features about ourselves will be wise to pay attention to our performance in school in order to infer those characteristics of us. I don't think anybody's going to deny that. And then the only last part of the argument is, and therefore, we adjust our behavior in school to not just learn things and not just you know do these other things, but in addition to adjust our behavior in order to look as well good as we can. And then, so then it's just a question of the percentage of the activity in a sense that ends up being devoted to that. Right. So, so the claim here is that um, school, the signaling part of school is just a, it's just a hurdle or a hoop to jump through or over to show that, that you are capable of jumping. Uh, you're capable of sitting and, and majoring in, in engineering. Right. Uh, it's not so much that you're going to use the engineering knowledge that you learn in school. It's that you're conveying to a future employer that you have the discipline and uh, sits flush and opportunity uh, to – not opportunity, but the, but the discipline and, and ability. Right. Now, of course, it's going to vary with the degree you get. For example, engineering, computer science, nursing perhaps – Uh, will be areas where you'll see a more consistent relationship between the kind of skills you acquire or develop in school and the kind you would use on the job. I'm not so sure. I'm uh, not sure the people involved in those, you know, it's it's a whole separate question here. One one of the appealing things to me about the signaling theory is that it explains why we teach so many things that don't appear to be useful. Right. They may actually be useful, but they don't appear to be. So, so, you know, over the last few years, I've talked to people who have graduated with an you know, undergraduate degree here and gone on to do things, and I have to say they, they don't seem to use much of what <laughs> right. they learned here. That's uh, what they say. You know, you have this, to be right. careful. You can't you – know, when I look back on high school, I, I went to a, a, what I think was, is considered a good quality public high school. I had smart teachers. I had very smart classmates, and it all seems like a blur. There are very few things I can point to that I have specific memories of, but I suspect there were some channels burned into the brain, some destructive, but mostly well, constructive. Most likely, but the right comparison has to be what channels would have been burned into your brain had you skipped school and went to straight to some other activity. So yeah, no, that's you know, tough after I and stopped school and went on to a job, I still learned stuff. Yeah. I still developed good habits of writing and presentation and many other things. So I think you know, that has to be the reference point for school. The question is, what skills did you develop uh, that you wouldn't have developed in some other imagined internship or apprenticeship or something else you could be doing at the time. So the key question with the signaling theory is to me an empirical question, which is, is there a cheaper way to convey my quality to a potential employer? Right. Uh, And given that school is extremely expensive, it's surprising there isn't a cheaper way, which, which, creates skepticism in my mind about the signaling aspect of education, and I don't see any empirical evidence on the other side that makes the case that that it really is a signal. Well, there was this example I think I gave you a lot on our last interview. Um, if you're trying to impress somebody on a date, you might be trying to impress them with your wealth, your health, and your intelligence. 
Uh, we now have uh, accurate ways and cheap ways to signal those things. You could show them a bank statement, you could show them a doctor statement, or you could, a physical fitness test, and you could show them an IQ score or education score. But honestly, uh, it's not common for people to bring those documents to a date. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah. It, yeah it's so true. there's the question: Why haven't these more efficient mechanisms of showing uh, health, wealth, and intelligence uh, displaced the apparently inefficient me signaling mechanisms we use for dates? So on dates, we do try to show our intelligence, but we try to be witty and knowledgeable in conversation. We try to show our health by being able to drink a lot and stay up late and being full of energy and our wealth by driving a nice car, or taking to a nice restaurant, wearing a nice suit. These are inefficient signals of the main kinds of things we're trying to signal right. on a date. Right. We should just show up, present the data, <laughs> right. and just say, eh, or send am the I, data am I in? Time, right? Did yeah. I make it? Am I <laughs> exactly. across the line? Or is it? Right. So, so this whole story suggests that there is some um, you know, friction, <laughs> difficulty of changing sort of ancient habits of what signals what to uh, substitute in new modern technologies for signaling things. So. Well. Before we get to that summary I promised, let's talk about a different aspect of this, which is we've touched on this in a couple of other podcasts. The general unease we have with with monetary uh, aspects of, of life. Sure. Because we could take some of what we've been saying, earlier conversation about motives, and, and talk about why uh, capitalism is, and the market is viewed with suspicion by many people and why – non-monetary, non-capitalist, non-market associations are viewed as higher motives, right? right. Because in theory, especially among uh, economists and, and uh, market-oriented folk, we don't have those associations. We don't view them as, as disparate, as, as offensive or, or inferior, but most people do. Most people look at monetary motives, at uh, the, the, these kind of phenomena as – Inferior. So, so there's a standard example, which I'm sure you've heard before, of you go to a friend's house, they make a nice dinner, you have a nice conversation, you say, this was great, you lay a $100 bill on the table. Uh, this is not... Well, I usually bring, <laughs> no, I bring it with me, and I present it before the meal. Instead of bringing the wine, I bring just the $100 bill to say, instead of bringing wine, uh, I, yeah. I'm, I'm bringing you a... A hundred dollar bill because I appreciate you making dinner for me, and this way you'll be able to buy the wine right. that you like the most rather than the one that I think you'll like the most. And that argument is a sort of straw man economics argument as to, as to why money is better than in kind transfers, and yet no one does that. Right. Almost no one. So I mean, it's a standard signaling story, but I think it's persuasive. Um, you just ask yourself, what would you think of somebody who did that? In an ordinary context, what would that tell you about them? And this is a, basically a key to thinking, figuring out signaling phenomena almost anywhere. You ask, if somebody did something different than the usual thing, what would that tell you about them? What would you likely infer about them? But the puzzle is, why don't I say, what a great guy. He brings the $100 bill over instead of, a, instead of the $100 bottle of wine. I don't like wine, it turns out. He didn't know that. And now I have $100. Why wouldn't I like that? Why wouldn't I think more of such a person? That, to me, is the puzzle. So what's, what's, right. the, what's the answer there? Well, there's my colleague Brian Kaplan likes the theory, which I also like, which is just generically people who do weird things have problems. And so if there's a social convention to do one thing – and anybody who does something moderately different, there's some level of suspicion about that. So you need some advantage to overcome that extra suspicion of just doing anything weird. All right, but there's a huge advantage. One, right. you're, you're, th there's advantages to being weird, which is, oh, someone's out of the mainstream. That's pleasant. It's a change of pace. Well, if they're out of the mainstream the same way you are, well, <laughs> then it bonds you together. But, but secondly, isn't there a, there's a big gain there, right? If I'm not a wine drinker and a person brings me, let's make right. it a little more realistic, a $20 bill, as they, as they cross the threshold, I say, thanks for coming over you know, to the, to the, as the Hanson family arrives at my house. And I say, right. Robin, thanks for coming over. And, oh, you brought me a $20 bill. That's so nice because now I can buy the bottle of wine I like right. the most. Instead, you bring me a bottle of wine. I don't like it. I don't drink wine. Say, what, what would be the – why so, don't so I thank that there's two obvious things you might be signaling, which are bad things to signal. One is the kind of relationship you think we have. Uh, that you, you know, so you have a different relationship with your maid than with somebody who, who comes over, and you people want to distinguish those relationships. And uh, if you just said a good thank you to your maid, uh, that's going to be a problem <laughs> rather than paying her, right? Uh, and similarly, with somebody else who cleans up after dinner and you, you paid them, you might they might, especially if there was some you know, similarity between them and a maid, they might wonder, I wonder, you know, are, are, are you thinking I'm a maid here, correct? Uh, and also, then there's the issue of uh, 
long-term debt. So we, we like people to be in our debt. Uh, and we, we, uh, we are, there's this issue of long-term allegiance. And so I think I went over this some in the last podcast. When we're trying to signal our loyalty and allegiance, there's the issue of signaling short-term and long-term allegiance. And those can be different. So if somebody, say, stops by the office every day and chats with you, you know, the nice, pleasant chat before they go out to their office in the morning, that signals a short-term allegiance, but it doesn't necessarily signal a long-term allegiance because it's not clear if the winds blow differently that they'll stop doing that, right? We're especially interested in what would signal a long-term allegiance. And so a long-term allegiance is going to have to be more about large expenditures that we do infrequently, especially when you need them. And that's going to be a special potent signal of long-term allegiance because just before the large thing, you would you would skip it. So like a feast, an annual feast. That shows at least they're planning on being with you for the next year. If they're about to dump you just before the feast is a good time to do it because, hey, they have to throw this big feast or, you know, Christmas dinner or whatever. Uh, so similarly, you know, we'd like to sort of accumulate these larger debts. So it's at least it shows a longer time scale on which they, they owe us and we expect to be with them. Um, so, you know, paying off immediately... Uh, signal something about your intentions for the long term. Says yeah, I want to, but the wines are payoff, an immediate payoff too. I, yeah. I, 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 maybe, I think there's something different going on. I'm not quite sure what it is. Um, but what's clear is going on is they are interpreting you differently. I mean, well, regardless of what exactly the signal is, it's about signaling. It's about the inference made about you because you did this action, as opposed to the direct benefit of the hundred dollar bill. Right. No, I, sort of two levels here. One is why did bringing a gift of something similar that would complement the meal become the signal of being a decent person as opposed to cash? And then there's the other kind of response you could have. You could say, as you said, you know, I could say, well, you know, after the meal, you know, I really appreciated that. Let me let me repair your toilet. I notice it's running and, yeah. and uh, it's going to take me about 45 minutes. I've got some tools in the car. We also think that's weird too. It's not monetary. Right. It's it's like the bottle of wine, but it is not the convention. So so there is an issue about what's out of the ordinary. But I, I I'm just not sure. To me, a lot of it is. Um, a lot of this is uncomfortably speculative. I, I yeah. understand you're saying, True. you know, geez, you're not showing me data set here. You're not kind of an experiment, a controlled experiment. You're just sort of uh, making up these stories, waving your hands. <laughs> you obviously don't listen <laughs> enough to kind of rub. That part doesn't bother me. It's it's the. Um, Let me say what bothers me, and I'll let you then – we're we're almost out of time. I'll let you have the last word and, and try to give us a sort of overview of, of – I want you to counter what I have to say, and then you can sort of add some more goodies as you go along. Um, there's imperfect information in the world. We don't understand ourselves very well. We have trouble understanding the people we interact with. We understand, Everyone agrees on that. So the question is, out in the real world, to cope with that imperfection of information – we obviously want to convey information uh, either by what we do, what we say, how we spend our money, um, who we spend our time with. And, and those have ramifications beyond just the immediate. So I, I accept that point. What I have trouble with, and this is where we get into the policy area, is that a lot of people who hold your view um, think that, that signaling is, is, is wasteful and something should, quote, be done about it. Uh, or that this imperfect information needs to be fixed in, quote, better ways. I tend to look at it and say, well, maybe the information is not so imperfect. So, for example, in the case of the educational story, it's hard for me to accept that these costs, which are very large, that competition among those who could provide the test uh, of discipline, et cetera. Now, the date example is a little bit Unfair is a counterexample. It's clever, and I like it a lot. It's a great point. It's really thought-provoking. But it's different than my relationship with an employer. If I could show my employer my IQ test, my discipline uh, uh, enzymes and, and other things, that would go probably be a – that would probably emerge in the marketplace. So I wonder why – one answer then is that those things don't emerge because they're just costly as well, and schooling is the best way to convey those signals, say. The alternative view is that, well, this whole signaling thing is overrated. People are really good at evaluating how good people are as employers and, and it's just – as employees. And this whole thing is just made up. It's just a clever little uh, uh, mathematical model that people can, can come up with to, to try to raise questions about the quality of education. So in all these cases, I find them sort of interesting. I think at the back of your mind – back of my mind, I'm always wondering about underlying economic forces – 
as in the case of the provision of health care, for example, where we might – there's an entrepreneurial opportunity for someone to save people lots and lots of money. And I understand sometimes it's the spending of the money itself, which is the signal, so that won't work. But I just – I wonder about market forces, the competition that we were talking about earlier. So g give us an overview since I'm sure we're all confused a little bit. It's very been very, very interesting. But give us an overview then of, of sort of your worldview of how this imperfect information signaling uh, interacts in our lives. In the history of economics, uh, the first formal papers to ex lay out the signaling story uh, were on first education and then adverse selection and insurance. Uh, That's in the modern world. It's in the theory of moral sentiments and Adam right, Smith, but too, the first probably. Mo <laughs> formal thing. So that influenced the modern literature to focus on this education and the insurance as these primary examples of excess signaling. Uh, they don't necessarily be the best examples of this in the modern world. I don't want to lay a lot of my stake on those being strong examples of signaling or not. That there's a degree of signaling in both of them, and uh, that's op an open question. Uh, where I would want to lay my case is just on the overwhelming evidence that an awful lot of what we do is done for appearance sake, sometimes co often consciously, but even more often unconsciously. Uh, it's just hard to deny, if you look at human behavior, <laughs> that people aren't paying attention to how other people will perceive them and taking that into account in what they do. And it's pretty hard to escape any model of that having the possibility, the consistent possibility of excess signaling, where that induces you to do too much in some sense. So, yes, there's some, you know, in principle market failure relative to some ideal world where we, we all knew everything. So does that mean there's a scope for regulation to solve these problems? That's part of what you were asking. Um, and, of course, that always comes down to the details. Uh, First of all, you have to admit there's benefits from signaling in that uh, information is communicated. And if this is the only way that the information can get through and it's really valuable information, then you might say this is just the best we can do. Uh, you just have to accept this information getting through. Possible regulatory actions might be to say tax or discourage, otherwise discourage activities that have these signals. And that could in a, some ideal world, you could end up with exactly the same sorting and exactly the same information going through. But any realistic world with there's some noise, you're going to increase the noise in the signal by doing that, and, and not as, quite as much information will get through. And then there's the question of how important that sorting is. So, you know, for example, if we're trying to impress potential mates with uh, being an impressive person, and there's a lot of expense to that whole, you know, courting process, then if we somehow taxed courting and had, you know, parents choose their kids' matches, if you thought they, who married who wasn't that important exactly, but, you know, just yeah, getting people it's roughly very, matched. It's very similar to the healthcare example. It's not right. clear that free choice in mates is better than parental right. decree. Absolutely. But, but most of us would be appalled by it. Because that's the society we've grown up yeah. in. Uh, so... It's in principle possible to imagine many of these kinds of signaling activity being taxed. I mean, one other consideration, of course, is you'd have to find something that's not signaling to do it relative to it. In a sense, right. if everything is signaling, you, you can't just tax the signaling. You have to figure out the, the bad, the right. worst signaling to you tax. You can't let parents choose the mates because they won't, you know, they'll be pursuing their own self-interest. Maybe, but I mean, you know, most societies where parents did children choose mates it doesn't seem yeah, to have worked out that well, badly. Yeah. So I'm not going to put a, I'm not going to say that that necessarily <laughs> works badly, but. Uh, but then, of course, parents just, you have signaling by the parents instead of by the children. Uh, so it's not clear you're reducing signaling overall. You're just Different kind of, yeah. switching it over. Uh, but the other thing I'd mention is, the other important thing I'd mention is if you actually identified the kind of activities that seem to be signaling kind of activities that humans involved in, I'm going to call these admirable activities. They're activities that people admire the people who do them. They are activities that inspire admiration because they are signaling, you know, good characteristics about the people who do them. So in some sense, these activities that we're doing too much of are the admirable activities. We, anything people do in part because they want to be admired, they're going to do a little more of that. And that all else equal would mean they do too much of it. And therefore we do too much of the admirable activity. So you might think government or other social conventions could do a could help us by somehow taxing and discouraging our admirable activities. But if you actually look at what governments and other social organizations do, they do the opposite. They tend to subsidize and encourage the admirable activities. So education gets subsidized, healthcare gets subsidized, the arts get subsidized, sports get subsidized. All these activities which have pretty str which we have pretty strong reasons to think people do them to show off, we like to encourage them. Well, but I'm going to interrupt you there for a second and I'll let you keep going. I Aren't those admirable activities often things that produce positive externalities that this cultural idea that 
we want to signal that we're admirable as one way of overcoming those the fact that they probably otherwise would be underprovided? There are no doubt some admirable activities that also have positive externalities. Spillover effects. It benefits people other than ourselves. So that if we right. only took into account how we felt about it, we wouldn't do enough of them. So, for example, you might say research is something like that, that uh, there's a you know, right. externality spillover from research. People do research to show their, how impressive they are. Therefore, when we subs and then, therefore, because it's admirable, people do more of it than they otherwise would, and that's Which a good, is good thing. Right. But I think there's this, this broad trend to subsidize admirable activities that have negative externalities as well. We, we aren't very discriminating. We just like to subsidize all these admirable activities. We, we like art and sport and everything else. And I think it's partly because each community wants to be impressive to other communities. If uh, the more you subsidize internal admirable activities, the more you make your community look impressive relative to others. And so I think there's the opposite tendency of signaling by communities to uh, race to the top, which right. is really a destructive race, right? Yeah. We've got uh, Washington has to have a, a very high quality baseball team. Otherwise, it's not a major league city. So we exactly. build a ridiculously yeah, exactly. expensive stadium for the 40,000 people who go there 81 days a year and we make everyone else pay so for it. So we can it, be seems, proud to be a distinguished high quality city, right? But I think that's just a lie. Most of it's just power politics and special interests. But but, but that's p power politics in the context of a public opinion that's supportive. Maybe. I'm not sure. And, and so. I'm not sure. You know, so most nations subsidize research and the arts and things like that for national prestige, and they're pretty straightforward about it if you actually look at the documents and discussions. Uh, well, that's what they'd say to signal that they care, but they're really just enriching uh, academics and artists probably. Sure, but there's lots of other people they could enrich that they couldn't as plausibly get away with this. So no, that's that a good they, point. That's, maybe, that's part of the reason we subsidize farmers, right, which is a bizarre thing. A handful of people in America who make hundreds of thousands of dollars um, – above above the average, and yet there might even be widespread public support for farm subsidies because farmers are admirable. It's something yeah. salt of the earth. Noble. Like, and yeah. um, let, no, I've derailed you, but let, let me c ask you to close on a different note. You said a lot of interesting things. What's the implication for me, the average person listening to this? What what How, how can I use these insights – to lead a better life, a more interesting life, a more profitable life? Um, am I supposed to – is there a virtue? Uh, I think there is, but is there – I don't know if you do. Is there a virtue in stripping myself of some of these illusions about myself and others so I can lead a more honest life, uh, uh, freed from so, – once I become aware of these tendencies, is that a good thing, a bad thing? Is it, is it – what should I learn from it? I wish I knew. <laughs> Uh, so clearly, if you just want to understand the world and you don't understand this, you're missing a lot. And you're just going to be frustrated consistently not getting what's going on if you don't understand this very essential part of what's going on. So, of course, you could say, why do I need to understand the world, which is fine. <laughs> but so for those of us who are trying to understand the yeah. world, this is an important thing to do. Now, uh, will this make me think better of myself? Uh, you know, you probably in the end have to accept that you're like the theory says most people are like you're Motives are more based than you like to think. You're more selfish, self-centered. Uh, maybe that can help you sort of overcome it a little if you want to by at least staring it straight in the face and seeing what's feasible. But uh, but in other areas, like the healthcare example, it, it should make me a wiser consumer. Well, right? in a sense, you get stuck in because you're stuck in the same equilibrium. You realize, for example, maybe medicine isn't very useful. Uh, I'm not getting very much out of this. I could cut back, but then my family won't think I care about them. So, you know, I guess I can't cut back as much as I otherwise would, because otherwise I'll be sending the wrong signal. And you know, you'll be on this. You'll be on the realistic margin of trying to be more efficient about things and more getting more of what you want, but realizing a lot of what you want is to send the right signals, and that limits your freedom to move here. So you lose your friends and family, but you have <laughs> lots of more money to spend on. Yeah. I don't know what, <laughs> the games that you're good at. Uh, <laughs> Some of us just want to understand things, look the world straight in the eye and see what it is. And even if it's not a pleasant sight, we still want to see. Well, that sounds nice, Robin, but you don't fool me for a minute. Okay, well, let me ask the question a different way uh, you know, about the practical application of these ideas. Do we really want our children or ourselves to see everyone as self-interested doing things for appearance sake to get an edge over others. Yes, as social scientists, I can see the argument that to understand various phenomena, cultural, institutional, etc., that's a useful way to help us understand the world. But, but at what price? I don't want to treat my spouse this way. When she does something loving or kind, I don't want to think she's just trying to get me to do something in turn for her or to make me think she's doing something kind. I like to think she actually is kind. And 
in the, the essence of religion in some deep sense is to suggest that we can overcome our baser instincts, no matter their source, and become better people who care about something other than ourselves and not just about our appearance. Uh, what do you think of that? I think both of those statements are true and, and relevant here. Uh, I mean, it's true that a lot of our behavior is at root due to baser motives that we don't like to acknowledge. It's also true that if we were to acknowledge those more explicitly, we might not be as happy with ourselves or as successful with other people. So part of what happens when we're signaling is that we self-deceive. And that's part of the essence of the signal in some sense, is our ability to fool ourselves and not acknowledge or admit uh, the source. Uh, and it's also in some sense part of our ability to be noble and rise to the ideal levels that uh, we sometimes hope we do is to uh, not acknowledge how much we do this for reasons of glory and appearance and to be admired. It reminded me of the Hayek quote, which I've, I haven't quoted in a while on this show, which I quote every once in a while because I think it's so powerful and useful. He said uh, in The Fatal Conceit, part of our present difficulty is that we must constantly adjust our lives, our thoughts, and our emotions in order to live simultaneously within the different kinds of orders according to different rules. If we were to apply the unmodified, uncurbed rules of the microcosmos, i.e. of the small band or troop, or of, say, our families, to the macrocosmos, our wider civilization, as our instincts and sentimental yearnings often make us wish to do, we would destroy it. Yet, if we were always to apply the rules of the extended order to our more intimate groupings, we would crush them. So we must learn to live in two sorts of worlds at once. My, end of quote. So my takeaway from our conversation, Robin, and I want you to modify it or challenge me if, if you disagree, is that we have to have a certain schizophrenia in how we look at signaling, that it's useful to observe strangers and our larger social organizations and institutions as um, merely the product of, of some baser instincts and some um, inauthentic uh, surface signals to to gain approval, to gain uh, money and other things. But that if we use those insights too far in our own families or with our friends or in our perception of ourselves, that that's a pretty – that's an unhealthy thing. And I, I like the illusion. I, I think of you as sort of a, a truth seeker. Um, an illusion, perhaps. But I, I do think of that. I think of, of what we try to do as, as scholars in the ideal is to seek truth. We know, obviously, there are other incentives involved. But the seeking of truth in ourselves, which is, um, you know, really, to me, goes back uh, in modern times to Descartes, is its own form of illusion sometimes, as we've mentioned in the past here. And would we not be healthier and, and live better if sometimes we live with those illusions and didn't try to strip them away, those biases and, and things that we uh, – the baggage we carry with us? It seems that our evolutionary heritage is almost certainly saying that to be successful, we should have these illusions, to, uh, to, you know, to have ordinary healthy relationships, ordinary healthy uh, sense of ourselves, confidence, uh, arc of our lives, that uh, the ordinary illusions are the sort that are most useful. That seems reasonable and presumption. Those of us who choose to become scholars at some point dedicate ourselves to some level of seeking the truth. And then it's somewhat, something disturbing, somewhat disturbing to later on, years later, discover that this uh, dedication to truth uh, exposes us to, uh, you know, finding out that uh, many of our ideals about ourselves are illusory, including, in part, the fact that we think we're seeking truth. And so <laughs> those of us who are saying out loud, uh, you know, the emperor has no clothes, uh, there are many naked illusions out there that people aren't facing, have to admit that we're saying this in part because we want the glory, the <laughs> achievement or whatever, or at least the dogged cussedness of <laughs> being the sort of person who could say that out loud. Uh, so there, there we are. We, we face that conflict. But uh, this is who we are. We are scholars. We are people who have in part dedicated ourselves to this. And if, if we won't speak this, at least in private, to somebody, no one will. Uh, I think this comes to a key question about why economics took so long. And I think it's, you know, from a distance it's puzzling. You say, uh, you know, we understood the nature of star, you know, stars and, and 
strange chemicals on the ground and all sorts of things around and the wind on the oceans far long before we understood very basic things about social interactions. Yet the data of social interactions has been around with us for a long time. It's been very accessible. It's been very salient, the sort of things we really wanted to understand. And yet organized social science seems to be, you know, very backwards compared to all these other topics on which uh, we had some incentive, but uh, was, you know, a lot farther from our immediate interest and experience. And it seems one explanation is that there are these illusions that were precious to us <laughs> that are important to our social functioning. And, uh, you know, straight eyed looking at our social world got in the way of those illusions. And we at some level understood that and backed off from social science. And so this is part of why social science is so late to the party of uh, academic insight, because uh, there are so many things that we at some level don't want to know. But are you suggesting, do you want to come down on it once where, the, where you would draw the line on how, where you'd strip away those illusions about appearance? I mean, for me, just, just to, to take an example, uh, I, I may have mentioned this before in the scalping podcast, but one time I was trying to buy a ticket to a baseball game and was with my family. We were out on the street. The guy offers us tickets and says, um, you know, the game sold out. And I said, uh, I don't think so. And he said, well, why would I lie to you? And my 12-year-old son, <laughs> who I've taught to be somewhat skeptical, 12-year-olds at the time, started laughing because, of course, he understood that, that the scalper had an incentive to deceive me, to make me think that, the, uh, that there was an urgency – uh, about the tickets that probably wasn't probably wasn't there. So I want my children to understand that, to be aware, not to be taken advantage of. I want them to be skeptical, but I don't want them to treat me that way in my relationship with them or their siblings. I want them to have a a naivete, and it's an to me that's an interesting, you know, schizophrenia of sorts that that I would teach them something that is to me very real, which is the incentive for the scalper to deceive. But I want them to see their siblings as honorable, loving siblings and not to be skeptical and cynical about their motives and their interactions with each other. Is that an appropriate thing to do? Would you draw the line there? Would you draw it somewhere else? Or do you think we should have overcome all our biases and, and strip them all away? Paul Graham has a fascinating essay this month on lies we tell our children and why, and uh, it's a complicated subject, and I'm not exactly sure where I should come down there. Uh, but the way I would phrase the answer to your question is to say, let's look at costs and benefits. Uh, the sorts of wa situations where our evolved intuitions to deceive ourselves and to have pleasant illusions are most likely to be appropriate are situations that are very much like ancient situations. Relationships between a father and a son might well be one of those, uh, between uh, sp spouses or lovers, uh, even an employee or, and, and a, an employer, perhaps. Uh, so in those sort of situations that seem very much like ancient similar situations, I'm going to say ancient evolved sense of what to do is probably about right. Where I would think that's the least right is in situations that are the furthest from those ancient evolved uh, intuitions. So when we're talking about, say, world policy about global warming or future of robots or whatever else we're talking about, uh, we're talking about the foundations of quantum mechanics or something like that, or in sort of the basic nature of, you know, government and what it's good for, uh, these are pretty far from uh, ancient evolved intuitions. And these are situations where we don't need everybody to face their illusions necessarily, but we need some people to face their illusions and to come to grips with the truth. And we need, uh, and we need that not only because it's important and uh, big, but because uh, we are the least likely, our evolved intuitions are the least likely to be about right there. If we uh, misunderstand ourselves and the appeal of world government, for example, and we either do create a world government when it's not appropriate or we don't make one when it is appropriate, that's a really big expense. That's really difficult for us, and uh, we need to somehow face up to that. Uh, and, of course, as I've argued before, one of I think one of the best ways to perhaps draw this line is to create betting markets on important topics, and the people who don't want to see the odds can just look some other way and the people who think they really need to know what's the truth about something would look there and figure out whether world government is needed or whether global warming is really a problem or whatever else it is. Uh, my guest today has been Robin Hansen, my colleague here at George Mason University. Robin, thanks for being part of Thank EconTalk. You. Thanks for having me.
This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.